In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Make us worthy, pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Everyone together, let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us into himself, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord, our God, the Pontiff of Torah, to guard us in all the peace, this holy day, and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord God, the Pontiff of Torah, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself, spared us, supported us, sinners, brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us to complete this holy day and all the days in our life and all peace with your fear all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, and the rising up of enemies, hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from your people and from this holy place. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through the grace, compassion, love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the worship are due unto you. With him and the Holy Spirit, the life giver, who is one essence with you, now at all times and to the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercies, according to the multitudes of your compassions. Blot out my iniquity and wash me <clears throat> from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity as my sin is at all times before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil before you, that you might be found just in your sayings, you might overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sin my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth, you have made manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear gladness and joy, that the humble bones may rejoice. Turn your face for my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a directing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and the ungodly man shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. For if you have desired sacrifice, I would have given it to you. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices to God are a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart. God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your good pleasure to Zion, and let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, offerings, and burnt sacrifices. Then they shall offer calves. Uh, unto your altar. Hallelujah. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity we may get together in this upper room, Lord, and we can hear a little bit more about your word and the guidance, Lord, for truly your word is a lamp to our feet, Lord. So I ask that you fill the upper room right now, Lord. I ask that your Holy Spirit be active. I ask that you wrestle with hearts today, Lord. I ask that you take anything off of our eyes that is preventing us from seeing and opening up our ears to your message, Lord. I ask that the message be applicable today, Lord, and be something that we can directly apply into our life, that we may grow into a deeper and more intimate relationship with you, Lord. I ask that you apply this message to us individually, Lord, so that we know what you want us to do and what you want from us, Lord. The areas of our life that you want us to address, Lord, the same areas in our life that are preventing us from moving forward into a deeper relationship with you, Lord. I ask that be so spoken to every single one of us here, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, and you forgive us, and you hear us when we pray, thank the one voice saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so I know that I was the only one reading. So shame on all of you guys for making me do that all by myself. Shame on all of you. All right, let me uh, put this on Do Not Disturb. Okay, can we come to a general understanding that when we pray the, the prayer of thanksgiving in Psalm 50, we can all do it together? I need more buy-in. Yes. yes? Okay, hopefully. All right, I'll tell you what, I think next week, I don't think we have a meeting next week. I think Abuna said there's no, uh, there's no Sunday school next, year, next week for the festival. There's nothing, okay. Okay, so you guys can have next week off, but then in two weeks, I expect everyone <laughs> to be able to, to pray that with us. Oh, this is the wrong talk. Hold on a second. 
unless you guys want to talk about Joshua 9, but that's not what I had planned. <clears throat> All right. So um, I know every week I've been promising you guys that we're going to start a new series. But last night while I was preparing, I, I was looking at the calendar and I said, okay, so we have this week and then next week we have the Marad. And then after the Marad, then we go into like Lent. So um, once again, there's no series because we'll probably start something to cover the whole period of Lent that we can kind of focus on while we're doing, while we're doing the fast. So I was just kind of thinking and I was trying to think, you know, what is something that, that I feel like God wants us to talk about? Something that he kind of wants us to, to address. And I will, and maybe this is, and I, I've told you guys this before, but a lot of the times... Um, whatever I'm sharing up here is stuff that I'm kind of working out kind of in my own life. And it just gives me a good example, gives me a good reason to kind of dive in a little bit and kind of think about that. And um, the end of the year is always, at least in, in my situation, it's a time of temptation. Okay. Um, now, I, I will tell you, why do you guys, why do you guys think that might be? And is it just me? This is purely, this isn't even spiritual. This is like straight, like fleshly. Like what happens at the end of every year? I eat a lot. I eat a lot. Yeah, because everything you go, you're going into the holidays and there's good food and people start sending like baskets to work and there's like candy and chocolate and catered like lunches and like, you know, all of this other stuff. Um, so this idea that was kind of like ringing in my head was this idea of temptation. Right? Because I think that we can all acknowledge, and we'll just talk about, like, for an example, we'll just talk about the food aspect of it, right? Um, but when it comes to temptation, temptation's like one of, like, it's a struggle. I think it's a struggle for every single one of us. We all deal with it differently, and we're all tempted by different things. But this ability to be tempted by something, to understand it, to wrap your mind around it, and ultimately to have victory over it, like, that's a challenge. Like, like that's hard. And that's why during the holidays, we have a very hard time saying no to our temptation. And then what happens on January you know, 1st or 2nd, then we, we all start the diet then, right? Because at that point, we say, okay, we've indulged enough, right? Let's, let's go ahead and let's kind of pull it together. Um, sometimes successfully, most of the times not successfully. So I was kind of thinking about what the, what the Bible has to say about temptation. And I know that there's a lot of great examples in te temptation, but I wanted to talk about was a clear passage that would walk us through what to do in temptation, in a time of temptation. And I came across the epistle of St. James, which is a great epistle. It's short. It's only like four chapters. Um, but he starts addressing this idea of what it's like to kind of go through temptation. And not just temptation, but temptation as well as trials, because that's real life. I think a lot of the times we can look at like, you know, the lives of the saints, which are very motivating right? And it gives us the sense of holiness that we haven't achieved, but we know and we read that as possible. But at the same time, when we, we can't reconcile that with our life, okay? Because they were living a life of victory that we are not, like, we, we haven't figured that out yet. And that's what I love about St. James, because one of the things that he's talking about here, and I know even in this meeting, the meeting's growing, the church is growing, you know, the groups within the church are growing, and, and it's great. And I think a lot of people have this misconception that once I start working this stuff out, and once I start going to church more, if I start praying more, if I'm in, if I'm in my Bible more, if I start attending meetings more, then things are going to start getting easier. That's a lie. It doesn't get easier, right? And actually, a lot of the times, the exact opposite, because the closer we get to Christ and the closer we get to the church, what can we start expecting more of? More struggles, more tribulation, more temptation. And I think a lot of the times I say, guys, if we don't understand that, then it's going to be, when we start getting closer to God, we're going to feel bamboozled. We're going to feel like I, this isn't what I signed up for. I, I was signing up for easy, right? And the last thing I want somebody to do is to start getting more plugged into the church and start experiencing the riches, right? Of the, the deep relationship with Christ and then feel that you were deceived when things start getting a little bit harder because they're going to get harder. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of us expect this path of blessings on blessings, right? And a lot of us expect this path where the blessing is going to make my life easier and I'm just going to kind of coast, but that's not it at all. Now, I'm going to tell you that will there be blessings on blessings? A hundred percent. Right? Will it be worth it? A hundred percent. Will God bless you? A hundred percent. Will there also be temptation? A hundred percent. Every single time. Right? And I love it because in, so I'm going to be in, in, in James 1, verse 13, it starts, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And I think that, like, that's, you read that once over, and you might be, eh, right? But I want you to really kind of think about that, right? It's basically saying God, God will not tempt you, right? Like, he can't be about that at all, because he's only good, right? And if he tempts you with something, he tempts you to make good decisions. He does not tempt you to make bad decisions. That is not from him. Um, but I will tell you, there's an urge that arrives inside, uh, arises inside of us, right? And, and what St. James is telling us right now, right, right from the beginning, he says, don't say that that's from God. If you're drawn towards something bad, don't say that God is tempting you, right? Because that's not what he does. And St. James, this must have been something that was going on at the church 2,000 years ago for him to be addressing it. And I think it's just as real today in the church because, you know, we want to blame something. But I, I don't want us to look at God and to blame God for the reason that we are being foolish. And I want to be clear about something because some of you guys might want to argue with me on this right now. Because you said, like, no, there's this one time, Pete, and this happened and that happened, and I want to chalk it up to this, okay? That does God test us? Yes, 100%. Does he tempt us? No, 100%. And when he tests us, Right? He'll put two options in front of us. But he is not putting the bad one in front of you saying, hey, choose this one. Right? He'll basically put two options in front of you and he will tell you, which one do you want? And that's his test because he wants to say that, no, God, I want you. I want what's holy. I want what's good. I want the blessings. I don't want the sin. I don't want the separation from you. But the, but the desire that draws us towards the bad thing, is that from God? No, that's from inside of us. That's from inside of us. And he further explains in, in verse 14. He says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So where does this start? It starts with us. Our own desires. Inside of us. And I'll tell you, it's hard for us to acknowledge that. It's hard for us to own it. Because it's much easier to blame something outside of us. It's something else's fault. Right? Right? And we want to blame outside. And a lot of the times we chalk it up to some spiritual struggle like, oh, God's tempting me to see if I can endure. 100% false. 100% false. That's, that's something that's inside of you. Don't make this about God. Right? The origin is not God because the one thing we have to remember is God is good. And anything that comes from God is good. And you have to, you have to believe that. But inherently we want to blame. Right? And I love this because original sin, right? It was, it was the woman. It was the serpent. They drug in, you know, her Adam. And the problem is, is in, in that whole story, was God anywhere found in it? Was God a part of that temptation? Was he a part of that fall? No. What was it? It was the deceiver, the father of lies, Satan. And it was this temptation that she saw the, the fruit as good. She knew that it was going to be for knowledge, and she was drawn away from that. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. God had nothing to do with that, right? And it's funny because so many times we say, God, you made me do this, you made me do that, you put me in this situation. And the reality is that we have to own the fact that we were lured away. We were enticed by sin. And the, the, and the biggest thing, and I'm going to tell you guys, like if you've got kids, one of the biggest prayers that you can pray for your kids is don't let them open Pandora's box right? Like that's one of the things, right? I just pray, God, keep, keep these things away from my kids. Because that's what happens, right? The second you step into sin, it's just like, just like even Adam, like right? their eyes were opened to this whole other realm. And that's what we have to pray, right? Like, because if they don't open Pandora's box, their temptation's a lot less, you know? And one of the things that I see in the world that we're living around right now, everyone experiments with everything, right? You can't get addicted to something you've never experimented with, right? The level of temptation will only be so strong for something that you haven't done. But the second that you have walked into that, everything changes. And, and, and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, to be honest with you, right? And I was thinking about this, and it's like a fish that chases the bait, right? And I honestly, I feel like a lot of the times that's us, right? Like we see something that looks appealing to us, and we chase it. And we think that there's going to be something on the other side of that, 
right? And a lot of the times I'll tell you, there's some times that we don't know if it's right or it's wrong. And there's other blatant times where we know that it's wrong and we chase it anyways, because we think somehow it's going to give us some level of fulfillment. In verse 15, and then it says, and then um, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And to sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And I want you guys to think about that, right? First, it starts with desire. It's conceived. Then it gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it's full grown, grows to death. So there's these stages here, right? And there's something inside of us that's in our inherent sinful nature, right? That longs for something that God said is wrong. And we want it anyways. But don't ever discount the fact that we have a choice. Every single time when we are walking in temptation and we're being lured away, we have a choice. And it's up to us to decide what we want to do with it. Whether or not we want to walk in it or whether or not we want to reject it, right? Just like that fish. That fish, he's looking at that bait. It has to make the decision to bite. Because if that fish never bit, that fish would be perfectly fine. And it would be swimming you know, minding its own business, right? It could either bite or it can swim away. In the same way that we are tempted, we have that same exact choice. This is the temptation stage, right? Everything up to that bite, everything up to like that giving in section, right? But once we go for it, right? Once we take the bait, and I love this because if you start thinking about it, every good thing that God has ever given us, Satan has a carbon copy knockoff right? If there's anything, like for example, finances, can finances be a blessing? A hundred percent, right? Right? Because you can have that ability to bless people. You can have comfort. You can have this, you can have that. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But what's, God, what's Satan's cheap knockoff? It's greed, right? Saying, oh, God's saying it's okay for you. If you look at the Old Testament, you see blessings upon blessings upon blessings, right? But Satan's knockoff is greed. No, it's not enough. Get more. No, it's not enough. Get more. If you just got a little bit more, you'd be happy, right? One of the holiest things that God can give us is love and intimacy in, in marriage, right? What's Satan's knockoff of that? It's lust. Why do you need to be married? Why do you need to be in a committed relationship? Why do you need to do all of this other stuff, right? I can give you that same pleasure without all of that other stuff. Everything that God meant for good, Satan will give you a cheap knockoff. And then we bite the bait. So the, th the problem is, is once we bit the bait, then we've conceived in sin, right? And it goes on and it says that sin goes on and every single time sin produces, you guys should know this one, sin produces death. And the scary part of it is, is that's biblical. It's in the Bible many, many, many times. You will not change that. You will not be the exception to that rule. When God wrote that, he didn't say this is going to be great for everybody, but so-and-so, right? It's, it's the same for every single one of us. So sin is born, and then it grows, and after it grows, it brings forth death. And I had an example here, but I'm not going to share it, actually. I just got to put them, I, I can't talk about that. Um, but I just want you guys to think about something that, imagine when it's conceived and it grows, right? On the sin side, even when you're in your sin, you could be rather optimistic about that. Right? You could be thinking, because if we, if we had to be honest, it says many of, these, many of us, what we do is we sin to meet unmet needs in our life. Right? So we seek that stuff outside of God's will. And then while you're drawing from that sin, you're receiving pleasure, whether it be affirmation, whether it be whatever it could be, right? sense of security, all of this stuff, and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. And at that time, you might be thinking, this is going to be okay. This is going to work out. Right? I can balance this. Right? Like I go to church on Sunday, I might even stay for the adult meeting, or I do this, or I do that. Yeah, I have this aspect of sin in my life, and it's kind of, you know, I'm going to manage it well, right? But let me ask you something. When's the, when the last time you tried to manage a sin, how did that go for you? Has, everyone, has anyone ever effectively managed their sin and kept it small? I don't know anybody. Because if you, if you leave unconfessed sin in your life, there's only one thing it does, it grows. Right? And then it's growing and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. And then all of a sudden, sooner or later, because it's a biblical promise, I know that we like talking about the good ones. We like talking about Jeremiah and I have a plan for you and a promise for you and a purpose for you, plan to bless you and all of this other stuff. Like we love those biblical promises. But there's another biblical promise that says consequence of sin is death. 
And if you're honest with yourself, you've felt that before. And it'd be, it could be a level of death in so many different areas of your life. It could be relational death. Maybe you hurt somebody. You know, maybe you did something that costed you a relationship. You know, it could be spiritual death, where there's areas of your life where you don't even feel the presence of God anymore. It could have been weeks, months, years, because you have unconfessed sin in your life and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing and it's causing death in that aspect. Um, but the thing is, is no matter what, no matter how you slice it, there will always be death. And the problem with sin is it's enjoyable. So while you're walking in that and while you're doing that and you're making decisions, one bad decision at a time and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, I guarantee you every single one of us in here will think this isn't going to lead to death. There's no way this is going to lead to death. No, no, no. I have everything under control. One of the things I always, I, I, I tell my boys, I tell even people at work and I say, you know, Satan is always trying to get you to write a check that you're not willing to cash. Right? Because we make decisions and in the back of our mind, we say, man, if this comes out, this is going to be bad. Right? And what's the voice in our head tell us? It's never going to come out. You're good, Pete. It's never going to come out. You'll be okay. It's just between me and you. Right? But I'm going to tell you, it, it always comes out. Right? Every single time it's going to lead to death. It will always end. It will always have depression. It will always... And, and it was funny because I was thinking about this even in Genesis 3, the original sin. Right? She looked at this apple. She thought it looked delicious. You know, she wanted to eat it. She was going to come with some knowledge. And what does it say? She bit into the apple. Her eyes were open. And guess what? Oh, crap. Here I am. Right? Does it talk about the taste of that apple? Talk about whether or not the apple is any good? It doesn't. Because it's never good. It's never good at all. We might see it as good, but it's never good. Right? And I love it because in verse 16 it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved, uh, my beloved brethren. Do not be deceived. I don't want you to fall for it. So James is basically saying, saying James is saying, look, I've seen this play out a thousand times. Like, I don't want you to fall for it. Don't buy into the lie. You, you can't. And in verse 17, it says, every good and perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights, of whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And I love that, right? Because at first I'm like, what does that mean? Right? So we know that every good gift comes from above, right? And it comes down from the Father of lights. But it says that there's no variation or shadow of turning. He's basically saying, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. If you ever think that you want something good, there's only one place to get that. There's only one place to get the good gifts. You can't get the bad gifts like from God because God only gives good. Okay? But if you're going to the bad guy, if you're going to the deceiver and the father of lies, expecting good gifts, you're going to be deceived every single time. It will never, ever happen because... The good stuff only comes from God. And I love it. I love it because it says there's no variations or shadows of turning. He was basically saying God will never overpromise and underdeliver. God is not the deceiver, right? Because that's what happens, right? Satan will come to you and he'll be like, oh man, you know, little, little, bit, little bit of this here, a little bit of that there. You know, you can dabble in here. It's okay right? You can just manage this sin, but this is going to be so pleasurable or, you know, this is going to be financially lucrative and no one's going to know. And he's basically deceiving you, right? What does God tell you? God tells you, if you do this, you get that. There's no deception at all. If you do good, you get blessings. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> God will never give us the bait and switch because he gives the perfect and he doesn't deceive us, nothing. But the thing that's crazy to me while I was preparing this is it's crazy that God offers us so much and he offers it freely. Freely. And we don't take him up on it. Not even don't take it up on it. Like a lot of the times I feel like we're not even interested in it. But at the same time, I'm going to tell you, if you took an inventory of your life and you look at the biggest blessings in your life, the biggest areas of satisfaction in your life, where did it come from? It's from God. Right? The things that I'm most thankful for in my life came from God. And at the same time, I don't go to him trusting him for more. Instead, I'm going to try to take a shortcut to go find it some other way. And I love it because one of my favorite verses, and I talk about this all the time, is John 10.10. 10. It says, I come so I may give you that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Who doesn't want that? 
Like, who doesn't want that? You know, but earlier in that verse, it basically talks about, like, who came to kill and destroy? Satan. He's still doing it now, right? He comes as a thief and a robber to come and to kill and destroy. But God comes and he offers us life more abundantly. Um, another verse I talk about all the time, 1 Peter 5, 8, it says that he is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? And I was thinking about that verse and I was thinking about the whole fishing thing, you know, and all he's thinking about is just putting that bait in front of you. He's just putting that bait in front of you. He's just saying, I just want you to take a bite. If I could just get you to bite, if I could just get you to bite, right? If I could just hook you, it's going to be game over for you, right? But I think many times we're on better terms listening to whatever he's tempting us with than with all the stuff that God wants to give us. So the point of today's talk, right, is I want to ask us, and this is the part where earlier in the prayer I said, I asked that every single one of us has an individual answer that we can walk away from here, right? An individual message of what God wants to address into our life is what's the lure in your life right now? What's the bait in your life right now that Satan keeps waving in front of you trying to get you to, t- uh, trying to, get you to bite? What's he using trying to lure you away from God? Because that's the thing, right? Like that's, you know, when you look at it that way, you're like, man, I don't want to bite that. But at the same time, if we were honest, what is it? What are we talking about? We're just talking about temptation. And that might be an area of your life where you're a little bit tempted, right? Maybe a lot of bit tempted. Maybe you're chasing something, thinking that like, you know, a lot of us, we're tempted and we're chasing and we haven't even bitten it yet. And I think that's an important thing for, to, for us to acknowledge. Like, where are we in the process, right? Are we in the temptation, right? Has it conceived and given birth to sin, right? Is it growing? Because after that growing, is there death? Like, you have to assess that, but I'm going to tell you, you need to know what it is in your life. So I'm telling you, and what I felt is that God is playing with every single one of us saying, don't be deceived. This only ends one way. Okay? So no matter where you are, whether you took the bait, whether you're growing, whether it's dying, whether whatever it is, right? I'm going to tell you that it always ends in death. And if you want to avoid how bad the sting of death is, you need to confess it and cut it off. Every single one of us in here, I guarantee you, every single one of us in here, we need to confess it and we need to cut it off because God will not be mocked, nor will he ever be made a liar. And whenever we pursue sin, it will always end in death. So I felt like what God was telling me um, last night was just to tell every single one of us and to encourage us, swim away from the bait. I know there's temptation in your life. I know there's internal struggle in your life. I know that there's things in your life right now that they seem very, very appealing. The same way that that apple was appealing in Genesis 3. And there's things that we, we, we feel that there could be some sort of fulfillment on the other side of that, right? And I am just telling you that God is telling you, swim away. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. It only ends one way every single time, right? You got to swim away, but we have to swim towards Christ. And I loved it because I was thinking about Psalm 23, right? Where he's basically saying, like, I'm the good shepherd. And it's funny because the the shepherd's only as good as if the sheep decide to follow him, right? Because if he was a shepherd, but the sheep kept leaving him and were not acknowledging that he was a shepherd, how would that go, right? So God's basically saying, says, look, I'll I'll be your shepherd, right? Like, I'm going to give you everything that you need. Like, I will provide, I promise you, right? I'm going to take you down to green pastures and I'm going to let you, you know, not barren pastures, not, not a pastor where you can't find grass. He's like, no, I will take you, I will take you to where it is good and you will be able to eat and eat abundantly, okay? He says, I'll take you behind still waters, right? Still waters, not just so you can drink a little bit, right? But you can drink whatever your heart desires. He's like, matter of fact, I expect you to drink so much that you yourself can be a fountain to other people. And he's saying, I'm the good ch- I, I can provide all of that for you. And I promise you, I will provide. I will give you everything that you need. Blessings on blessings on blessing. And I love that St. James basically just points it out. And he tells us, if you want good things, if you want good things, it only comes from God. The temptations, they're going to lead you astray. Empty promises. So my, my, my prayer for us is let us not be deceived. And we have to acknowledge the fact that is temptation real? 
hundred percent. There's not a single day none of, one of us walks away, you know, without being tempted, right? But we have to acknowledge if we want to overcome temptation, we have to acknowledge where does it start. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys now just to see if I wasted the last 20 minutes of my time. Where does the te temptation start? It starts within, right? Inside of us. And if we miss that, if we are not treating the core problem and not just a symptom of the problem, if we are not like, taking care of the inside of us, then we're going to be in bad shape. But God can take care of the inside. Right? Instead of all of that time where we're basically spending it thinking about that temptation and dwelling on the temptation and imagining the temptation and daydreaming about the temptation, if we took that and we started channeling those thoughts towards what is good, what is pure, you know, what is heavenly, everything changes because it's going to clean you from the inside out. Right? Because the temptation is real. It starts from within. But then I'm going to tell you that it's enhanced from everything on the outside. Right? It's enhanced by everything we surround ourselves with. But it never comes from God. Because God only wants to give you good things. And if we pursue sin, then it only ends one way. So my challenge for us this week, right? And actually it's going to be a two-week challenge because we're not going to be here next week. But for the next two weeks, pursue what is good. And that's going to look different for every single person in here. Right? But if I'm telling you that you need to spend more time with God, right? You need to be in your word. Right? You need to be in prayer. You, need, you might have some aspects of your life or some things that you're letting through your senses that you need to cut that stuff out. We're not, gonna, we're not going back to that. Right? We need to clean it up a little. And I'm going to tell you, pursue God. What's that look like for you? And I promise you, if that's an honest prayer, God will tell you. He will tell you, this is why I, I need you to read your Bible. You know, I need you to attend church early. Early. Like, like, like before communion. <laughs> like <laughs> early, right? You know, I need you to attend a meeting, right? And he's also going to tell you, I need you to stop doing this. I need you to stop looking at that. I need you to stop listening to this. I need you to stop worshiping that. And I promise you that when we do those things, God will give us great things. It's his, it's his deepest desire. Amen? All right, stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because we know that you're such a big God, Lord. Such a big God, but you care for us so individually. And Lord, I know, Lord, I know that you have a plan for this, for every single one of us, Lord. I know that you have a purpose for us, Lord. And I know a lot of the times we walk around just breaking your heart, Lord, choosing other things over you. But Lord, I ask that you just put a special zeal inside of us, Lord. Uh, we just want to pursue you and that we find our, our fullness in you, Lord. We don't want to be deceived, Lord. We've, been we've spent our lives deceived. We've made bad choices, bad decisions, Lord. We've tasted the sting of death. And we don't want that anymore, Lord. But sometimes it's just what's right in front of us. So, Lord, I ask that you just allow us to fix our eyes on you. Lord, you're what we want to see. You're what we want to desire, Lord. But we can't do it on our own. So, Lord, I ask that you just clean our hearts. Lord, I ask that you just give us a thirst for you, Lord, for it's your promise where you said that, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they shall be filled, Lord. So, Lord, I know that you are faithful to your plan. You will fill us, Lord. I ask that you put inside of us the hunger and the thirst. Lord, I ask these things lifted in the session of all your saints from our tears. Here's what we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. See, I didn't know we had construction pictures up here because I, caught, I thought something really interesting was going up in, like, in the corner of the room. <laughs> but...